Hey everybody, before I get started, I just wanted to mention a couple of ways that you can engage with me on a more personal level. I have a few avenues set up and I keep focusing on one and I figured, why don't I make a short little video talking about all of them real quick before we get into these uh, episodes. So first thing, Patreon. There's a link in the episode description and every episode description to the Patreon, as well as uh, a video on the feed called Major Announcement that has all the details of what each tier offers and how much they cost. I implore you to check that out. I offer a lot of cool shit for my patrons. Uh, second thing, the Discord channel. There's also a Discord link in the episode description and in every episode description. I have multiple channels set up there for each show that I'm covering, and it's a great way to just engage with me. I have a channel set up for... Uh, uh, MMA talk as well. I'm a big MMA fan. So if you're an MMA fan, you can check that out as well. There's a link to the discord in the episode description. And then lastly, oh, the Facebook and Twitter, social media, follow me on there. I post news on there. When I say news, I mean like, hey, I'm stopping covering this show. Hey, I'm starting covering this show. Let me know what you think about this. I do uh, live watches of things on Facebook where like I'll check in and say, I'm watching so-and-so show. And then I'll like live comment while I'm watching it. And that'll be cool if maybe you watch that show too and you want to watch along with me or you're watching it later and you want to see my thoughts, which are usually pretty entertaining because I'm usually pretty high when I'm writing them. So uh, check out all those links in each episode description and let's talk about this episode. Peace. One mic, one mic. Yeah. All I need is one mic. One mic. All I need is one mic. Hey everybody, welcome back to One Mic. And today I'm here to talk about season one, episode seven of Apple TV Shrinking, entitled Apology Tour. Uh, Jimmy goes on an apology tour in this episode. If you're unfamiliar with that term, it's just like a thing where you gotta apologize to a bunch of people. That's why it's a tour, like you're going from stop to stop. Uh, he apologized to various individuals over the course of this episode over his behavior at Brian's engagement party. The old, uh, you know, he was constantly drinking during that party. There's the vomit scene, so... Uh, he's basically apologizing for his behavior. And I thought this was a pretty minor part of the episode. And I'm like, again, their episode titles kind of confuse me because that seemed like a strange aspect of this high of this episode to highlight. But while I was preparing my notes, I'm not going to say I'm totally on board with the episode title now. But while I was preparing my notes, I got a little bit more on board with it. So um, we'll kind of cover that as we... Uh, move through this episode, but I kind of want to start by, well, actually, I want to start by talking about the episode. I thought this was a really strong episode, one of the stronger ones of this season. I loved what they did with Paul. I love what they're doing with, um, well, I don't want to say love. I'm, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by what they're doing with Gabby and Jimmy, not as a pair, but individually, how they're dealing with what they're dealing with and how they're dealing with each other. I feel like, and I'm going to, I'm going to, talk about this episode kind of like in a character by character breakdown with the major uh, individuals that I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about Gabby at one point and I'm unsure if the show is being, if the show and the actress is being brilliant with this role or if it's being tragically underserved. And you're like, how can it be both? <laughs> how can it be one or the other? Like there's nothing in between. I, I, we'll get there. Trust me. Um, I want to start by talking about Alice, talking about Alice though. Um, so we ended last episode, Alice tries to uh, kiss Sean, he turns her down, he says, you know, you're just a kid, and it just is not good for her. But like I said, like I said in the video, Sean was giving mixed signals, but whatever. In this episode, though, I feel like Alice was confusing. Like, Alice kept making things weird, and then would react to the weirdness as if she wasn't the one that created it. <laughs> like, okay, so give you an example. She start like, the first, there was two examples of this in this episode. The first is... She comes downstairs and she's like, yeah, I'm totally over, kiss, over you trying to kiss me last night. And I like that was weird to me because, and Sean starts to say something and then she reacts to how weird she just made it. But um, I don't know if Alice was trying to, like, I, I don't know how I feel about this scene because I don't know what I was supposed to take away from it because I don't know if Alice was trying to lighten the mood by being funny like, oh, haha, that was crazy how you tried to kiss me last night. Like, knowing that uh, that she was the one who did it, and we were supposed to read into that kind of like that sarcasm or that jokingness, or if she was actually trying to be serious, and that's how she was trying to cope with the situation, by trying to pretend like she wasn't the actual instigator of the situation. And if she was trying to be funny... Maybe I'm being a little bit of... Maybe I'm nitpicking here. Maybe I'm being a dick. I don't know. I, I hate how everyone is reaching for 
uh, reasons to get offended in today's world, but I don't think it's funny to make it sound like the old black man was the initiator initiator of the kiss of the underage white girl. Like that's just not funny to me. Like you like you don't play like that. And I like <laughs> and I feel like I like again I'm taking it, I think I'm I'm taking it a little bit too seriously, but at the same time like. I still, I'm taking it that way because I don't know what to take from it. I can't tell if she was being serious or not. And if she was being serious, what the fuck? So like, <laughs> like either way, serious or not serious, I'm not a big fan of her doing that. But then I also don't know what the show wants me to take from that. Am I supposed to be looking at it like that? Or do they not realize how weird that is and how really off-putting that is, especially for me as a black man, to watch a underage white girl come down and jokingly pretend like the like the the adult black male try to make a move on her like that's just not funny to me so like I don't I don't know what the show was going for with that scene but I wasn't a big fan of it and then she makes it weird again when she was trying to uh ask him about like bike riding with him and she snaps on him before he even has a chance to answer and I'm just like why do you keep making the situation weird and then reacting as if Sean did anything. He didn't he didn't he didn't even say anything to her in either one of those scenes. He starts to and then she freaks out. Like why did it like I don't understand um what I'm supposed to be uh taking away from Alice's behavior. Cause there's too many things that I'm having trouble getting a read on. Okay, so another weird Alice scene. So Jimmy's doing his apology to her. He stops in her bedroom and he, she's like, no, it's all good. Don't worry about it. I ain't even worried about how you was acting last night. You was wilding, whatever. No big deal. I'm not worried about it. I'm dealing with my own shit. And he's like, well, can I help you dealing with your own shit? And she's like, yeah, you're just the person I wanted to talk to. Uh, something, something to that effect. And he sits down. And then she's like, you didn't catch the sarcasm? And I'm sitting there like, motherfucker, I didn't catch the sarcasm. Like, if, you were, if that's what you were trying to deliver, it did not come through. And the thing that's weird about that is I feel like it normally does. I just feel like everything Alice did in this episode did not work. And I don't know if that was the show trying to tell us, like, this is how affected she is by Sean, by the loss of her mom, by falling out with her dad. Like, this is how affected she is. Or if the actress isn't just re isn't really delivering the scenes right. Because I rewound it. And I'm like, maybe I'm like, maybe I'm tripping and I'm I'm giving this actress like not enough credit. And I rewound it, and I'm like, no, I still don't think the sarcasm comes through well. And then I'm left to wonder what was meant by that scene, because I don't know what I was uh, meant to take from it. So, like, did everyone involved in the show, everyone on the set, the director, Alice, the actress who plays her, think that the sarcasm came through, and then we're supposed to be laughing at how oblivious Jimmy is, and how dumb, like, oh, she was obviously fucking with you, and you didn't get it, ha, ha, ha. Like, is that the joke? Or was it supposed to be bad sarcasm? And we, the audience, are supposed to be tricked by the scene because that was the experience I had. Like, and it, it still made the scene work because, uh, like, she's go, she goes, you didn't catch the sarcasm? And I'm like, shit, I didn't catch the sarcasm. And it made the scene kind of funny for me. But I'm like, it can't be meant both ways. She can't have, have uh, intentionally been bad with sarcasm and not intentionally been bad with sarcasm. Like, both things can't be true. So either we were supposed to notice the sarcasm or we weren't supposed to notice the sarcasm. And I don't know which one that is because I didn't notice it. But I don't know if that's what they were going for. And I think it just, it, again, I think it was the, the character's delivery. and I, I Or the actress's delivery, I should say. And I, I don't know. I think the scene worked, but I think it worked accidentally. And I'm not really willing to give their props for that. <laughs> like, you weren't clear on what you were trying to do. It worked anyway, but like I'm not giving you a pat on the back for that. But yeah, I thought this was a weird episode for the Alice character. Um, moving on to Paul, yet again, Paul's storyline continues to be, for me, the most compelling. He has the best scenes. Um, you know, now that I think about it, I'm less confused by the title because I think Paul kind of goes on an apology tour of his own. It's just not really a tour because he doesn't hit multiple locations. He goes on an apology tour with his, his daughter, but <laughs> it is just one person. And that's kind of what, that's one of the other reasons why I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be so hard on the apology tour title. But I do want to explore what Paul's dealing with. Uh, through the lens of remorse, because you could tell there's a tension between uh, uh, Paul and his daughter, I think Meg, right? Yeah, Meg. You could tell there's a tension between them 
that essentially revolves around Paul being an absent father. Because we learned in a previous episode that he got divorced from the mom when they when she was four. And then he kind of just like that, that they separated and they, they fell apart or whatever. And he tries to even tell her, like, I, I can't remember how he worded it, but the, the idea, the, con the the thought that I took from it, what I thought he was trying to convey is like, if you want to have the hard conversation about me not being in your life, I'm willing to have it. Like, we can have it. I'm tough. It's fine. And she's really kind of like, uh, yeah, whatever. It's fine. Water under the bridge. And to me, this was kind of like the start of Paul's apology tour. Because Paul, again, he doesn't hit multiple locations. He doesn't hit multiple people. But he hits Meg a couple of times. Well, uh, that's inappropriate when we're talking about father and daughter. But <laughs> he um, <laughs> he apologized to her a couple of times. And I looked at that and I was like, okay, well, this is kind of like, this kind of can play it to the apology tour angle. But um, she later signs the paperwork from Brian, the paperwork that Paul has been avoiding even having signed because he didn't want to tell her what was going on with him. And then she asked him to move in with her and her husband and uh, their son, his grandson. And um, that shows that she's really willing to let bygones be bygones. Like, she's, she was meant it. She's like, yo, it's squashed. We're not beefing, whatever. Like, inviting him to live with you proves that, that yeah, it really was. She, it really, she really was water under the bridge, and she wants him to move in. And this is the part of the scene. This is my favorite part of the episode. He turns it down, and he says that he has a commitment to his patience, which is true, right? He's a, he's a, it's a lot to ask of a man who's, I think she said he's 72 or something, like 70-something. I think Harrison Ford is actually like 80. <laughs> but um, he's, uh, you know, he's a 70-something-year-old man with an active roster of patients. And it's, it's, that's a lot to ask for somebody in that scenario to just up and move across the country. Because then they say she lives in like Maine or some shit like that. Like, like literally like as far as you could possibly go. I, I can't remember the locations. I watch a lot of shows. But I feel like saying that move across the country, I feel like I'm not tripping by saying that. So... When Meg hits him with some pretty harsh accusations that I think we know aren't really the case, but she's perfectly justified in feeling that way, it kind of stings for us as the viewer because I think we all like Paul. So for him to get hit with shit that even if we feel like what we know about Paul states that that's not really true, what she's saying about him, she has every right to feel that way and he has no retort for it. And it's like, you kind of feel bad because like, we like Paul, but he's getting shit on, but he has, but he does deserve it. So it's kind of like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> but it does sting a little bit. You know, when she finds out that he's making time for Alice, because he's like, you know, who, the, like the little girl, he's like, no, that's actually Jimmy's daughter. It's like, okay, you're making time for Alice, who is not only not a patient, but somebody else's daughter. And you know, for her as his actual daughter, who he hasn't been around for to help raise, you know, he won't make time for his own daughter. I'm just like, damn, I don't believe that's who Paul is. But she, why would she think anything other than that? She has every right to feel that way. And she's like, I keep hearing about how great you are. And all I can think about is how you were never around for me. And the worst part is when he says, he's like, I'm not ready to do all. He's like, I'm not ready to move in with you. And he says something like, not yet anyway, or something like that. And she's like, oh, so you only grace us with your presence once you need us to feed you and take care of you. And it's like, oh, my God, that is so harsh. And I really don't think that Paul meant it that way. But again, what can he possibly say? That is exactly how it comes off. He's already old. He's forging this connection now that he has Parkinson's. He doesn't want to move in. And he says, not yet. Like, okay, I want to wait till I'm worse off. And I need like, I don't think he is doing it with ill intent, but that's what he's fucking doing. And it's like that. Man, it sucks. And then, like, to to put the goddamn cherry on the fucking ice cream or whatever the fuck that, that phrase is, the cherry on top of what is a, a really emotionally impactful scene. After she leaves, she slams the door. And, and then he jumps when she slams the door, which I thought, thought was a nice touch by Harrison Ford. She, he jumps when she slams the door. And then he she starts, she leaves and he start, he freezes up and he can't move. And it was, that was a great callback because we learned that, that was a symptom of his in the earlier scene with his doctor, which I thought that scene was cute when she notices that he likes the doctor. I was like, aw, <laughs> like, aw, Indiana Jones is in love, aw. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, like that was a great, and then his frustration with it, like, of course this would happen. If it, like, that's how I would be if, because he's like, yeah, every now and then I can't move after, you know, I want to move and I really can't. And he makes it sound like it hardly ever happens and it's not a big deal. And then in that moment, after going through that emotional trauma, asking your daughter to stay, she leaves, she slams the door, you're sad, you're disappointed, you're angry, and God damn it, now you can't fucking move. Like, <laughs> like I, and then he's so angry.
That was such a great scene, man. Harrison fucking crushed that. I keep saying Harrison like I know him. Harrison, that was my first time saying it, but I say it in my head like I know him. Uh, great, great, great scene by Harrison Ford. Um, okay, I want to, uh, I think I'm closing here by talking about Jimmy and Gabby, and then I have some thoughts. Um, so, uh, well, one, one, we opened the episode by learning they actually had sex. I didn't know if they were going to have sex or not. Like, maybe they were going to kiss, and it was never going to go to that, but they did. Um, and Gabby says she's over them having sex after she talked to Tia. So she talked to a picture of Jimmy's wife, and she's like, yeah, I explained that we were drunk, that you were saved dick. She said it was cool, no big deal. And then she's very casual about casually making jokes about them having sex. Um, very good jokes. I'm going to talk about the thoughts, by the way. But it made me wonder if she's truly over it. Like, did that really work for her? Or if she's using this as a coping mechanism to get past it and to just be able to move on. And this is what I was saying about Gabby earlier. The show's not giving me that. The show is giving me, I talked to a photograph and now I'm cool. And if that's what they're giving me, that's what they're giving me. I'm not going to say that that's not possible. I'm not going to question it, whatever. That's what they're giving me. That's what they're giving me. But I feel like that is a very basic, uninteresting angle to take with this character. But I think the angle of putting on a smile, putting on jokes, pretending like I talked to a picture and now I'm cool, but really inside, she's grappling with that. She's grappling with her own divorce. Like, I want to see a, a internal struggle with Gabby and not goddamn jokes all the time. Even though the jokes are good. Like, the Gabby character's funny. I just feel like they could be doing so much more. And this was a great opportunity to do it. And I feel like they fucking blew it because I feel like Gabby actually is like, yeah, I talked to a picture and I'm cool. Like, what the fuck, man? Like, I that's why I said, like, I don't know about the Gabby character because it could either be... Really kind of like, and we're underusing her, we're misusing her. She's just here for comic relief. We could be doing interesting things with someone who was going through a divorce, whose best friend died, and she has sex with his that best friend's husband. Lots of interesting shit you can do with that, and they're just making her fucking comedy relief the whole fucking time. So I'm like, that irritates me because I'm like, you you have a lot of good stuff you could do with this character. And you're treating her, of course, the, the, <laughs> the black woman, as giving her nothing more than fucking jokes to tell. When you could be doing good shit. But if they they could be building up to that still. Like maybe the next episode, Gabby, you know, decides like, I need to talk to Paul. And she has a serious scene where she lays out, you know, I've been bullshitting everybody, putting on a happy face. That would be great. Uh, but I don't know. I don't feel like that's what they're going with. And that's kind of disappointing. So uh, Jimmy later ends his apology tour by apologizing to Gabby for saying that he regretted the sex. Because he's like, you know, I don't really regret it. It gave me hope that I could, I could one day be okay. Uh, and then he tries to talk to uh, his, he tries to talk to his wife. He tries to do the picture thing, and uh, he actually tells her he wants to her to apologize to him for dying. Uh, which I, I mean, I feel like that's kind of a cliche thing. Like, oh, uh, I'm so, like, uh, how many times have you guys seen a, a film or a television show where somebody is like at a grave or something, and they're like, "I'm mad at you for leaving me" or something like that? A million times. So that's an unimaginative concept to have in there. But I did think it was interesting that he's like, I want Tia, like, Tia, I feel like you owe me an apology for dying. I'm like, God damn, even dead people got to go on an apology tour in this episode. <laughs> but as soon as he tells her that he fucked Gabby or, or jokes about it, he fucking Gabby, he looks and Alice is in there. So Alice overhears and uh, is upset for whatever reason. I don't, I, I guess, I guess she would look at that as a betrayal to her mother, but um. I mean, she likes Gabby. I feel like she'd be mad at Gabby. Gabby's her fucking friend. Like, like you're fucking my dad? Like, what the fuck? But, like I said, Alice was illogical this entire episode. And again, I don't know if... the I don't, I don't know if the writers feel like Alice's behavior in this episode was normal. Or if I'm, like, trip Or I'm tripping. Like, they think it's normal and I'm tripping. Well, no. If they think it's normal, I'm not tripping. Because it ain't normal. <laughs> so, I don't know if they think it's normal. Or if they're trying to make her act weird. And... I don't know. They just haven't kind of fully revealed it yet. I don't know. Uh, I, again, motivations with Alice and Gabby, super unclear. Uh, so I'll close it with a couple of thoughts. Um, I love the, uh, when she said, thanks. He's like, thanks for having my back. And she's like, thanks for pounding my front. <laughs> they got to do the fucking high five. I thought that was great. Um, oh, I didn't talk about this. Uh, I'm glad I put this in my thoughts. I like the conversation between Liz and her husband. I keep calling him Jefferson because he's Jefferson from Married with Children. I don't even know. His Is it Derek? I think it's Derek. I don't know why I remember that. I'm going to keep calling him Jefferson. It's an interesting combo between Liz and Jefferson. 
I said convo, right? Not combo. Convo. Um, she asked him to get out the house because she's like, you know, when you retire, I need my space. I don't need you all up around me all the time. Why don't you learn how to play golf? Why don't you get out the house, find something to do? And he's like, look, I worked my ass off for, I don't know, 40 years or whatever. I'm ready to chill at home. And I've earned that right. If you want your own space, you find some shit to do. And I was like, yo. <laughs> like, one, that was the first time they've had that character not crack jokes. Two, I thought that was an excellent point because I don't know people might look at it like the man being harsh to the woman, but my my re my reasoning behind saying that was the the right move to make is that they've established throughout this whole season that Liz is having trouble with the kids being gone. She's the one having all of the issues, right? The whole time we've been seeing Jefferson, he just been chilling, peeing in the flowers, you know, like, like chilling on the couch. Like he don't give a fuck. Like he's chilling. Right? So it's Liz that has the problem. But now she's telling him, like, oh, you need to go find some shit to do so you can be out my hair. And he's like, no, you need to get your shit together. And that that's true. Like, she does. She needs to find a way to cope. And she needs to find a way to deal with her sons being gone. She needs to find a way with, to deal with her husband being in the house. Because she's the one with the problem. Like, he ain't got a problem. He's chilling. He retired. Like you said, he put in his work. So, like, I, I thought that was a good scene. So I didn't understand why she got angry with him. She's like, are you fucking serious? I'm like... I, that's an excellent suggestion. Yes, he is serious. <laughs> but I thought that was like, I thought that was a great scene, but then I thought it was weird how she reacted to it. But I thought it was a great scene for Jefferson because it, like, it's the first time he got serious and he made a great point. Um, I love Gabby's face, Gabby's face after, so the morning after the sex when um, Jimmy's like, yeah, I'll have a cup of coffee black. And then she makes a face <laughs> that's kind of like, yeah, you would like it black, would you? <laughs> like, I can't remember the face, but it was funny. And then, oh, Paul made a great face, too, when he figured out that they had sex by pretending like he already knew. And then and, and Jimmy's like, fuck, or something like that. And then Paul made a face that looked like, I can only describe it as, like, bashful toddler. <laughs> I don't know what that face was. Uh, bashful toddler kind of kind of works. And then, like I said, oh, I already talked about this. Paul, Paul having a thing for his doctor was cute. Oh, and um, that pancake taco he made when he woke up. Like, I didn't like that just because, like, he kept holding it vertical. And I'm just, I, all I'm like, like, no, I know your hand is full of syrup. So, like, why are we, like, I can't, and I can't stand having any, I've never uh, said this on any of my videos. I'm really particular about my hands. I wash them all the time. I'm particular about what I touch. And I absolutely loathe having anything sticky on my fingers. It drives me crazy. So watching him hold, put, hold that taco, and he was even holding it kind of crooked when he dripped the syrup in. And I'm like, oh my God, there's syrup. There, there should be syrup running down his forearm. And I know that he was holding a dry ass taco in reality, but I'm watching a TV show. You want me to believe he just made this little pancake syrup taco? Uh, you want me to believe it? Then make him hold it so that the syrup's not gonna fucking drip onto his hand. And they, he, he didn't do it. So it freaked me out. I didn't like that. So, <laughs> That's all I have for this week. Let me know what you thought in the comments. I will be back next week for episode eight. That might be the finale. I think, no, I think this one has 10. Um, so uh, I will see you guys next week for episode eight. Until then, peace.